dear Lord, tonight, as we stand behind this sacred desk, I don't come asking for the riches of this land, neither is my prayer that high men may know my name. But Lord, just give me a clean heart, and I will follow thee. Lord, fix my heart that I might be pleasing unto thee. I recognize that I'm not worthy of all of these blessings, but just give me a clean heart. And I vow for the rest of my life that I will follow thee. Please, Jesus, anoint these lips of clay that we may speak as an oracle of Christ and none of ourselves, but hide us behind the glorious cross. Don't allow the people to see me, but only thee. Drop a Holy Ghost bomb in the midst of your people tonight and show us your glory. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Why don't you lift your hands and say, Lord, have your way. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you're my strength. And I'm also very thankful you're my redeemer. In Jesus' name, before you take your seat, why don't you just look at somebody near you and say, neighbor, tell him God is up to something. And you're right in the middle of it. Now tell him something good is getting ready to happen to you right now. Well, if you believe it, come on, clap your hands and praise God in this place. Anybody expecting God to do something tonight? Find somebody else on the other side and say, neighbor, tell him God is up to something. And you're right in the middle of it. Now tell him something good is getting ready to happen to you right now. Now come on, clap your hands like the devil's head is in between them and give God praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because his compassions they fail not, but they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. If you know we serve a faithful God, come on, clap your hands one more time and give God a great praise, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly I'm humbled and honored by this opportunity to stand before the greatest people in the world, a part of the greatest church in the world, the Church of God in Christ. Anybody know this is the greatest church? Clap your hands and praise God. Tonight, we honor and celebrate our leader who we consider to be the greatest leader on the face of the earth because he is our leader, our bishop, our chief apostle, presiding bishop. And it's so significant that we celebrate his leadership because in recent years, no other presiding bishop have had to face the challenges that our leader has during a world pandemic and has led us through and coming out of this pandemic. And the Church of God in Christ is stronger than it's ever been under his leadership. And I would that you would join me in celebrating our bishop, our leader, our chief apostle, the one and the only eighth in succession, the bishop, J. Drew Sheard. Can we celebrate and honor our leader tonight? God bless you, bishop. We honor you, we celebrate you. And I want to say publicly thank you for this opportunity to continue to serve our great church. Of course, to our first and second assistant presiding bishops, Bishop Jerry Macklin and Bishop Lawrence Wooten and all of the members of the general board, can we celebrate the leaders of our church? We honor you, Bishop Porter, Bishop Hill, Bishop Bryant, Bishop Hall, Bishop Covey, Bishop McClellan, and a former member of the AIM team here recent elevated to the office of general board member Bishop Elijah Hankerson. Let's praise God for our leadership. And we're so blessed to have our chairman of the board of bishops tonight, Bishop Galbraith, and all of the bishops of our church who have been most supportive. Can we clap our hands and praise God for all of the Episcopal leaders of the Church of God in Christ? To our general secretary, Bishop Lyles, and of course, Bishop Thuston, our chairman of the General Assembly and vice chairman, Bishop Jerry Maynard, we honor you tonight. And to the chairman of the board of trustees, Bishop Walls and the entire board of trustees, to Bishop White and all of the elected officials of our church who serve. Can we praise God for the leadership again 
of the church of God in Christ. I know some of you get bored when we do this, but the Bible says, know those who labor among you. And we honor them tonight. And we're so blessed to have our mom with us, the general supervisor for the Department of Women of the Church of God in Christ, the one and only Mother Barbara McCool Lewis. Thank you, Mother, for being with us. Just your presence alone blesses us, and we salute you tonight. And to the wonderful and lovely First Lady of the Church of God in Christ, she has been in just about every service praying for us and watching over us. And tonight we honor our First Lady Evangelist, Karen Clark Shear. Let's praise God for our First Lady. We honor you and to all of the First Ladies, all of the supervisors, we thank God for your presence here tonight. And I certainly want to appreciate all of the host bishops of Ohio who have wrapped their arms around us in these short few months to ensure that we've had a wonderful experience here in Columbus, Ohio. And I want us to celebrate all of them one more time. Come on, let's praise God for our Ohio bishops and certainly to the team, the A team, the AIM team. These presidents and leaders have went through tremendous challenges and have made great sacrifices to ensure the success of this convention. They are the epitome of what leadership is all about, that we're first in line to do the most by giving the most and giving up the most. And so I want the AIM convention this year to really give a rousing celebration to all of our presidents and leaders because without them and the sacrifices that they made, we would not be here. So let's celebrate our music president, Myron Williams, our youth department, President Nathaniel Green, Chair Lady Kennedy, our Sunday school department, Dr. Mark Ellis and Mother Penix, our missions department, Bishop Vincent Matthews and Mother Norfleet, evangelism, President Sprewell, Elect Lady Dorinda Clark Cole, our SMM, Pastor Jesse Williams. Can we praise God for all of our leaders? I ask that they will all stand and we want to honor you just one more time. Thank you so much for the tremendous and excellent teamwork that you have exhibited. And of course, AIM could not be what it is without so many people who sacrifice and give their time, talent, and treasure to ensure the success of it. And I'm blessed to be flanked by some of the greatest in the world to serve with us in bringing this all together. You heard the voice of Vice Chairman Kale Man. Let's praise God for him. Vice Chair Althea Sims. Vice Chair Christopher Payton. Our Executive Secretary, Bishop Designate Micaiah Young. Our Assistant Secretary, Superintendent Steve Tipton. And just a host of workers and staff, individuals again that give in day in and day out to make this happen. I want all of the AIM team, all of the AIM staff, if you do anything relative to AIM, will you stand? And there are many people out there. I want you to stand right now. We just want to honor you and salute you. Come on, people of God. Let's praise God for this amazing team. And of course, also to the jurisdictional AIM chairs who serve and work with us and they have been involved and supportive. And I want to honor and acknowledge Superintendent Gary Bush and all of the jurisdictional AIM chairs. Will you stand, those that are here? Let's praise God for all of these men and women of God who support our great church and this AIM convention. Also want to celebrate the greatest jurisdiction anywhere, Tennessee Metropolitan Jurisdiction. There are a few of them here tonight, and I celebrate you, our own beloved supervisor, Dr. Patricia Merriweather. We honor you tonight. And to my Citadel of Deliverance family, God bless you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support. And last but certainly not least, I must celebrate my family. My wife, I don't know if I could have selected, I know I could not have selected any better than Lady Stephanie Dillard to stand by our side and do life and ministry with. This week was her midterm week, finishing up her master's degree. And so she was in, her, in the room writing papers and in class, but she was also praying for me and encouraging me and lifting me. And tonight, I want the AIM convention to join me in celebrating my own dear wife, Lady Stephanie Dillard. There's so much I can say, but rest assured, I probably wouldn't be standing here if it were not for her prayers and her covering. I appreciate you so much. And Bishop Sheard, what blesses me about our family, 
I was born and raised in the church, born and, born and raised and taught to serve the church. And now when I look and see my children loving the church and loving the AIM convention and involved, my oldest daughter was working in registration and helping with hospitality. And then I almost came to tears a few moments ago, Mother Lewis, sitting on the platform. My wife texted me and said that my son had given $50 in the offering. And I didn't have to give it to him. And then she sent me another text and said, Joy gave $50 in the offering. And they're here tonight. I want my three children to stand, and I want you to help me celebrate my family tonight. Faith, Trey, and Joy. And all involved in ministry in some form or fashion. Let's give our great God another great praise all over this room. Listen, grab your Bibles and stand with me as we go to the Word of God. I solicit your prayers tonight. I certainly want to appreciate all of the prayers. And Church of God in Christ, again, is the greatest church in the world. We're like one big happy family. And we pray for one another and we cover one another. And This has been an amazing experience. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of the many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was falling upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. God bless the hearers, readers, and doers of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Verse 1 again, if you will, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, Hailing men and women committed them to prison. For a few moments, I would that you would indulge us as we talk about a challenged but changed church. Can everybody say that? A challenged but changed church. Can you clap your hands and praise God? A challenged but changed church. When our presiding bishop gave us the theme for this year, I believe in some way it sobered us because in some ways we have discovered that in this past pandemic and crisis that we've come through, it caused even the Lord's church in some instances to become more inward looking. And then we find ourselves in a place of survival mode without giving true attention to the mission of the Lord's church. I think it's significant that we understand what the church is, and not only what the church is, but what the church is not. Because when we look at God's plan for redemption, the church is necessary. But we find the origin of this need in the book of Genesis, when God creates the heaven and the earth, and then he turns around and creates humankind or mankind, created male and female, and places them in the Garden of Eden 
And he said, let us make man after our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. You know the story when they sinned against God and disobeyed God's commandment not to eat from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, immediately death became imminent. Not only that, but the image that God created them in was contaminated and stained by sin. And because of that, immediately when they sinned, God had already provided a remedy for their redemption. Not only their redemption, but their restoration. That's the whole idea of salvation and transformation to restore us back to God's original intent for humanity. We were not created to die. We were not created to experience sickness and disease. We were not created to experience the challenges that we see in this world. But God, he, it, he executed and initiated a plan for our restoration, not only our restoration, but he also had a plan for our realignment. Everybody say realignment. In other words, God's plan, hear me tonight, is not just about getting as many people into heaven or individuals to join a church, but God's plan is about restoring us again back to our original state the way he intended for us to be before the fall of mankind. He, want, he wants a world that would reflect what he has intention for, and the consummation of that plan is just not here. But when this is all over, he says, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem us, to realign us, to restore us. And when Jesus comes into the world, not only does he prepare to do what he has to do, but he also prepared those who would come after him. See, I think that's important that we pay attention to the leadership style of Jesus Christ because he was not only interested in what people could do while he was here on earth, but he really was preparing them for his departure. See, it's a poor leader when you only prepare people to serve you while you are there. But when you are a God kind of leader, you understand that God does not start with us. He does not end with us. As a matter of fact, the challenges sometimes we see in the house of God is that there are some people that believe that they are the first and the last. They are the beginning and the end. They believe they are Alpha and Omega. No, Jesus. Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. So if God does not start with us or end with us, then where are we? We are in the middle. We work the, look at somebody say work the middle, work the middle. He starts with us in the middle because there's somebody that came before us. And there will be somebody that comes after us. And so the true essence of leadership is preparing people to move and, and to continue even in our absence. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, we find him in St. Matthew chapter 16, where he asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And notice that they respond, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some says you are Isaiah, but then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. Hallelujah. And Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, what rock? The revelation that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to build my church. Can I pause right there to remind somebody that this is the Lord's church? I know that we have functions and responsibilities, but we need to be reminded this is the Lord's church. I don't care what you paid for that window pane. I don't care how much you paid for that pew. I don't care how long your family has been in the church. This is the Lord's church. I need you to tell somebody this is the Lord's church. He says, upon this rock. I will build my ecclesia. And then he says, and the gates 
of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't have time to dig deep into this, but this is the first time that we see this word church, ecclesia. Most of the time when we think about ecclesia, we immediately have a religious context in mind. But when you really understand ecclesia at the time of Jesus, it was not a religious term. It was a political term. It was almost like a private group or senate or legislative body where the emperor would call individuals out from among the people to come in where he would share secret information about his administration and kingdom and then send them back out. See, the reality is that Jesus really just did not come to establish a church. He came to restore the kingdom. So he says, I'm going to build my own ecclesia. I'm going to build my own ecclesia, my own group. I'm going to call some people out. That's what the church is. The church is made up of called out ones. I wonder, is there anybody in this room you've been called out? Called out of what? Call me out of darkness into the marvelous light. See, I'm, I'm, I wish we can go back to the church that was excited about being saved and excited about being in the kingdom and excited about being in the body. Now we have gotten so desensitized that we miss what Jesus was really trying to establish and now we find ourselves doing everything else but what he intended in the beginning. It's obvious that it's a kingdom because he says, I'm going to call you out to share information with you. Then I'm expecting the church to go back out. And I need them to spread the information. I need them to establish the order and protocol that I call for. And to show you he's talking about kingdom, the next verse, he says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. He didn't say keys to the kingdom. He said kings of the kingdom. Because if you're already in the kingdom, you don't need keys to the kingdom. But when you are in the kingdom, he gives you keys of the kingdom. That means uh, that these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, they'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Hallelujah. That's why kingdom people, even though we're going through this pandemic and there's been inflation and, and they're saying there's a recession, we are in this world but we're not of this world but because we have keys of the kingdom of heaven he said I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive when you are in the kingdom you don't have to accept anything that's not of the kingdom that means you don't have to accept the sickness the disease the lack the poverty I wish I had a witness in here you don't have to accept anything because you are in the kingdom that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Most of the time when we talk about heaven, we say up there. But heaven is an invisible place, but it's a reality. I know I'm going to get in trouble with this because I may mess up some of your theology because I already have eternal life. I'm not going to get eternal life. I already have it. I'm already in the kingdom of God. I'm already sitting in heavenly places. So I'm living in tension. I'm living in the already and the not yet and waiting on the full consummation that when Jesus come back, this will be all over. He says, I need to get you ready for my departure. Does what he needs to do. Hangs on the cross, bear it, get up three days later. Hangs out with his disciples 40 days. Acts chapter 1. Acts is an interesting book to me. I'm third generational classical Pentecostal. And you all know one of our favorite books is the book of Acts. But it's an interesting book. Yeah, we, we talk about the Holy Ghost Pentecostalism. But as I began to really look and take a deeper dive into this book, it's really, yes, a record of the, 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 the birth and the establishment of the New Testament church. It's a wonderful thing to read about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But it's also a messy book. 
because when you look at it, it is, it is filled with various things that really uh, informs us, I believe, of what God will have us understand about his ecclesia. And when you open up that book, you even see the trajectory of it uh, there beginning in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, which I believe it centers what the book of Acts is all about and the church. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall speak in tongues, you shall shout and dance, you, you shall turn in circle. No, he said, you shall be my witnesses. Now, when you get saved, the Holy Ghost, he baptizes us, according to Paul in Corinthians, into the body. But when we are spirit baptized, it is not to save us, but it's subsequent to our salvation. So the spirit baptism is to empower us, empower us to do what? witness to do service and empower us to live holy which had a witness in here so in jesus mind i'm giving you power to do what i call you to do i thank god bishop porter that god will never call us to do anything that he will not empower us to do watch this he said you shall be my witnesses in judea jerusalem Samaria, Judea, and to the uttermost part of the world. And when you look at the book of Acts, you go from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 7, they're in Jerusalem. Then they move from Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 12. You see them going into the surrounding areas of Samaria and Judea. And then Acts chapter 13 to 21, you see the mission expanding where Jesus Christ, the gospel, has reached Asia Minor. And then from Acts chapter 21 to Acts 28, we see where Paul is defending the mission that God has given him. But Jesus says, I need you to understand that you cannot stay confined to Jerusalem. This is for the whole world. They receive the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. The church is birthed and established. Let me hurry on here. All the way through Acts chapter 7. I contend that the church had gotten comfortable with being in Jerusalem. That they didn't understand that Jesus had given them a mission. See, what you have to understand about God is God is a missional God. And let me help you out that missions is not about passing out food and clothes. Now, we should do that. That's, that's charity. That's help. But that's not what mission really is. When you look at that term mission, the base word there is misio, which means going out of oneself. So when you're involved in mission, that means you're getting out of yourself and going forth into what you've been sent to do. Even when you look at the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, you see a missional God. Because God the Father He's a sender. What did he send? He sent his son. Then Jesus Christ, he is the sent that also is a sender that he sends the God, the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Ghost is not just the sender. He's the sending. He's continually sending us. That's why when you're full of the Spirit of God, He leads us to where we all go and all do and all be so that He can expand the kingdom. But the church, the church, the ecclesia, who had been called out, got complacent, got comfortable, and it got convenient staying in Jerusalem. I wish I had a witness in here. They had issues while they went to Jerusalem. They, they had issues in, in being able to see how we're going to provide for everybody equally. And they dealt with their problems. But my issue is, he said, going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. But they did not have in their mind to move out of Jerusalem. It's dangerous when you get comfortable with being comfortable. It's dangerous when you think that leadership and ministry and church is all about convenience. See, a church that becomes complacent, they no longer a missional church, we become an attractional church. 
and an attractional church says, come and see. I wish I had a witness in here. But a missional church says, go and tell. And when you are an attractional church, you focus on marketing schemes and branding, and we need all of that. I, I, I'm a man of order and marketing and branding, but I have sense enough to know that if we're going to complete the mission of God, it cannot be the next best attraction. And I want to thank our presiding bishop. When we were getting ready for this conference, I reached out to him. We were talking about the speakers. It was already in my spirit, Bishop said, we have some of the greatest preachers in the church of God in Christ. And I have friends in other denominations and I preach for many of them. But I remember growing up in this church, they didn't send out flyers before the convocation with the speakers on it. We didn't know who was speaking, you just showed up. And they would have preachers and evangelists and pastors that you didn't know that would stand behind the pulpit and preach the unadulterated word of God. But now we've gotten to a place we won't support our own church if we don't have the right speaker on the fly. Something is wrong here. We've gotten a little too off with this attractional. We got to have a special guest musical artist to get a crowd. The devil is a liar. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. We're in trouble here because we are more concerned about being attractional. That's why when we fasted, it was not going around telling everybody, you're fasting. Jesus said, wash your face. Even in the Old Testament, they had to go down and slack cloth in ashes. But now when we call ourselves fasting, we grinning and smiling, don't look like we're travailing and moaning and waiting before God because we've got comfortable with staying in Jerusalem. He said, I need you to get out. I need you to get out. I need you to get out of yourself. I need you to get out of your convenience. I need you to go where I tell you to go. Look at our world, people of God. We have issues pro-life, pro-choice. We have issues with same-sex marriage, wickedness and perversion, systemic racism, issues of poverty and mass shootings, police brutality against the black race, and the church is comfortable in Jerusalem. We're comfortable with just doing district meetings and jurisdictional meetings and, I'm sorry, Bishop, national meetings. So something is a little wrong when we spend more hours fussing and arguing about chairs and seats and reports. And we have issues of abortion and same-sex marriage and wickedness and perversion and systemic racism and issues of poverty, mass shootings and police brutality. But we are talking about who's going to be the next bishop, who's going to be the next supervisor, who's going to be the next president. Listen, at this point, I just want to be in the body of Christ to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given the Lord says, I got to get their attention. I got to get their attention. They didn't get it in a prayer meeting. They didn't get it at a revival. But the Bible says that God allowed great persecution to challenge the church. I heard you the other night, Bishop Matthews. He talked about, said he told the presiding bishop, if you hear of them kidnapping me, he says, don't pay the ransom. Let me die because we don't negotiate with terrorists. And the reality is there are a whole lot of people saying they're sold out Christians, but they're really not. And then what we're calling persecution now is certainly not persecution. Somebody lying on you is not persecution. From a biblical context. Them not putting your name on the paper, that's not persecution. I wish I had a witness in here. As a matter of fact, Jesus warned his disciples. He said, woe unto you if all men speak well of you. Can I get a witness in here? 
He told his disciples, they're going to hate you. They're going to kill you. Why? Because our message is offensive. He never told us to get along with the world. That's why he said the world would hate you. That's why the Hebrew Israelites will show up at your church. That's why they'll fight against, they're not fighting your church. They're fighting your message. And because we are afraid, we shut up. And we shouting and dancing. Dressing up, trying to impress somebody that you will never be able to convince. Let me stop. He said, they're going to hate you. It was a blessing to be able to die for Jesus. Now, this is an interesting thing, Bishop Hill, about persecution. When I started looking and digging deep in there, Mother Lewis, I was actually trying to find President Green instructions on how to get away from persecution, on how to fight back. And I couldn't find anything in Scripture. If y'all find it, you can talk to me after church. What he says, get together and strategize how you're going to fight back the persecution. Because I don't want you to get distracted by fighting persecution, that you are disobedient to the mission that you have. I don't need you to fight against something. I need you to fight for something. I wish I had a witness in here. So many times we find ourselves fighting against that we can't fight for. Watch this. There may be two things that you can do with persecution. It's your choice. You can take it or you can try to fight it. But a true Christian believer does not fight it because Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He didn't say, get a team together to get back at them. He didn't say, get together to fight, but he said, rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. You may not get one down here, but boy, let me tell you, God got something better than any man's reward, than any man's pat on the back, than any man's certificate. For so persecuted they, the prophets, who were before you. Great persecution hit the church. This is what blessed me, and I'm just about finished. I'm sorry that I'm cutting corners here. But he says that the persecution caused them to scatter. Watch this. It didn't say they scattered and hid. It didn't say that they scattered and tried to stop doing what they were called to do. We just read it in the text. He says there that they scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the gospel that they received in the ecclesia in the secret chamber with Jesus. See, in other words, in as much as the persecution was supposed to take them out, the persecution actually motivated them and caused them to go where God called for them to go from the very beginning. And the first city that is recorded that they went to is what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 in Jerusalem and then Samaria. But because they were so comfortable, they didn't go on their own. So God has to push them out. Could it be sometime God allows certain things to happen in our lives to push us? To push us to a place of obedience. To push us to a place of yes, Lord. To push us to a place where he purge us of our pride and grind down our ego to get us in a place where we say, yes, Lord. Because let me tell you something, people of God. You may get discouraged. You may even get disillusioned. Bishop, you may get distraught. You have a right, perhaps, as a human being. But you don't have a right to be disobedient. And the Lord says, I'm going to push you out. The challenge, the pandemic, I believe God allowed it to push us out, watch this, and back. Come back, 
come, come back come on here some not we weren't talking about come back to columbus come back to aim come back to your mission that's why i had to push you and had to take everything from you that you thought was church i had to take everything from you that you thought was the right thing to do to get you to come back they go down to samaria let me stop Acts chapter 1 through verse 7, we read about the Acts of the Apostles. But when you get to Acts chapter 7, the church is challenged, but they even have some changes. Stephen was a preaching deacon. Then Acts chapter 8 records one of the gentlemen who also was a deacon by the name of Philip, who went down into the city of Samaria, preached to them Jesus. And the Bible says that miracles started happening. Not only that, but demons with loud voices start being cast out. And the Bible says that there was great joy in that city. They were saved. They had joy, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost. So they sent word back down to headquarters. Because the Bible said that the apostles remained in Jerusalem. They send word back down to Jerusalem and said, there's joy in Samaria. They're happy. They're saved. They're experiencing miracles. But when they get word, Bishop Houston, that looked like a church was being established, they didn't send the Standards and the Stitches Committee, but they sent Peter and John who went down there not to establish a church, a district, or another jurisdiction, but apostles went down there to lay hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost and the Bible says that when Peter and John came in the city and they laid hands on them they received the Holy Ghost and there was a man by the name of Simon who obviously was a believer but he was twisted in his mind and he said I want what they got how much does that cost and you know what the Bible says that Peter told him man you and your money have perished together for this thing is not for sale and what Jesus was trying to show us that we may be persecuted we may be challenged but I'm going to change it I'm going to change you back to what I called you to from the very beginning can you shout glory 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 I got to bid you farewell. I had you too long, but I need to tell somebody that Jesus is counting on his church to change for the better. It may get rough. It may get tough. You may have to suffer, but I heard Paul say, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time felt not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us by Christ Jesus. Look at somebody next to you and say, neighbor, tell them there will be glory. After this, the persecution, it may hurt you, but it won't destroy you. But because God in you, the hope of glory, greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world nevertheless not mine but the Christ that lives on the inside that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings this one thing I do I forget those things which are behind me and I reach for those things which are before me I press toward the mark toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus look at somebody and say neighbor the next time you look for me you got to look up because I, I'm getting ready to go higher Church of God in Christ, it's been rough, it's been tough, we went wounded, we've been hurt, we've gone through some things, 
we've lost some stuff but I step by to tell somebody that we've been made we've been made into a fortnight but John John is coming in the morning good morning good morning what the devil meant for evil God is working it out for your good the persecution will not destroy you but the persecution is going to push you somebody anybody everybody wave your hand and throw your head back and shout glory I got to quit. I got to let you go. But while you're moving forward, if persecution, if trouble and temptation show up, just remember this. Be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roll. I've felt sin break of dashing, trying to come to my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus bidding me to still fight on. And he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou. Thank you.
stand where you are. We're just a few minutes from leaving all together. What a sobering word. What a sobering word. And I don't know if you heard what I heard, but what I heard was it's time to get uncomfortable and it's time to go be the church. Look down your row and tell somebody, I'm about to go be the church. God is giving us a burden for souls. And in this room, watching online, you may be dressed up, you may be Kojic ready, but you know in your heart of hearts you don't know Jesus the way you ought to know him. You know in your heart of hearts you're not in right standing with God. I don't care where you are in this room or where you are watching online. If you know you need to give God your life, every head is bowed, every eye is closed so that no one feels embarrassed. If you're in this room and you say, Elder Spree, well tonight I hear the word and I'm giving God my heart for real. That's the first call. If you're in this room without any shame or embarrassment, lift that hand as high as you can get it. If you're watching online without any shame, put in the comments, that's me. If you're in the room and you're saying, Elder Sprewell, I know I need to make a decision to give God my life for real. Lift that hand all over the room. I see you. I see you. Any shame, no shame. I see you. I see you. Everybody repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Come on, everybody repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. So I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died, rose on the third day, and you're coming back again. Say, teach me to love you, and I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Say this with an attitude, devil, I'm no longer yours. I close every open door. I'm saved right now. Now hear me, if you set that and meant it with your heart, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, you're saved that easily. Now first I want you to rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I said rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're saved then you know it, you ought to clap right there. Wait a minute. Lift your hands, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Lift your hands because God's about to anoint us to get uncomfortable in the four walls and go win the world for the kingdom of God. Father, we've already asked you to do it. And I've already heard testimonies of persons who've already been activated. But Father, another time I ask you to make us uncomfortable until we get a passion for souls. Don't let us rest at night until we get a passion for souls. Disturb our sleep until we wake up waiting for a chance to preach, to witness, and to win someone to Christ. I decree that around the world and all in this sanctuary are members of your church that are getting ready to be anointed and graced to be effective witnesses. So God, stir up the gift that's on the inside of us. We activate the holy power of the Holy Ghost to be effective witnesses. And Satan, I serve you notice that the worst thing you could have did was let the church of God in Christ get back together because now we come in for blood. We come in for every child every unsafe spouse we're not sleeping until the world knows the gospel if you're getting ready to go in your neighborhood go in your state go in your city when i count to three open your mouth and charge this atmosphere one two three Get a $20 seat in your hand everywhere. Get a $20 seat in your hand everywhere. Get a $20 seat in your hand everywhere. If you're giving digitally, the ways to give are on the screen. 
Those of you watching at home, you need to sow into this atmosphere. The glory of God is tangible in this room. And when you sow into this kind of atmosphere, you get immediate results. Uh, kingdom principles uh, are pandemic proof. Uh, and what we're getting ready to do is sow into this atmosphere because our kids are getting ready to get delivered. Our families getting ready to get saved. Uh, our churches are getting ready to get filled uh, because we're getting ready to go be the gospel. Get that $20 seat all over the room, all over the room, all over the room. Put it in your right hand and wave it. You say, Spree, I don't have 20. Get something. Don't leave this atmosphere without a seed in the ground. Get something. If it's 10, if it's 5, if it ain't nothing but a nickel, spit shine it and hold it up proud. We're about to play seed in this atmosphere. Wave it all over the room. Father, as we begin to sow, I decree that we sow into the glory that's tangible in this room. We sow into the ministry of the church of God in Christ. And ultimately, we sow into the lives that are getting ready to be transformed because of the call tonight. No lack because of the sacrifice. But God, let miracle money pop up because of the gift we're getting ready to give. In Jesus' name, if you believe God, holla, I believe. If you're giving digitally, wave your phone. in the house lift your hand lift your hands right there lift your hands right there come on and tell the Lord Lord I receive your word I didn't hear enough people Lord I receive your word mm, everybody's standing everybody's standing We're preparing now to hear the voice of our presiding bishop. But you would have to agree with me that God has stepped into this convention setting. The Lord has stepped in. in every message God has spoke to our hearts. And Lord, we receive your word. There's been a change in this church through the word of the Lord. How grateful we are that we have a leader who is open to the move of God's spirit. We pray for him, not only today, but we pray for him this evening, that God will place his anointing upon him yet the more. And it's not over until your leader has spoken. And tomorrow night we will hear his voice. But we have felt his presence throughout this week because he's been open to the moving of God's spirit. Would you put your hands together and let's give God praise for the leader that God has given us, the one and only Bishop J. Drew Sheard. Come on, everybody. Please be seated just a moment. Just give me just a few minutes and I promise uh, that I won't be long. Uh, I still say 
that we have the greatest preachers in the world in the church of God in Christ. Yes, I, I made some people mad because I said, let's use our own people. But I'm gonna tell you something. There is nobody that you could have flew in that would have been more anointed than our chairman tonight. <laughs> Nobody you could have flew in that would have been more anointed than Nathaniel Green this morning. Somebody say nobody. Nobody would have been as anointed as Vandalin Kennedy last night. Somebody say nobody. Nobody would have been as anointed as Gary Sprewell. And oh my God, nobody would have been as anointed as Vincent Matthews. I'm glad I'm in the church of God in Christ. This is a great church and anointed uh, Sunday school leader, Superintendent Mark Ellis. Oh my God. Just give me a minute. I, prob I promise I won't be long. Thank you, Bishop Macklin. And um, we'll get a chance to hear how the anointing rests upon the general board in our convocation. We're going to hear some of our preachers in the convocation. Amen. And uh, of course, it didn't, uh, it didn't just start here. When we got out of that pandemic, uh, we ran to Raleigh, North Carolina, and Bishop Patrick Wooden, excuse me, Bishop Patrick Wooden preached a tremendous anointed message in the men's conference. And then we went to the women's convention. And our mom, Mother Barbara McCool Lewis, kicked us off oh my god of course I I'm uh, I know my wife was anointed she's anointed when she prayed for me okay let me stop that's not what I'm a, God bless all the bishops I'm so thankful Chairman Dillard good God Almighty you preached us into a frenzy tonight and uh, I enjoy it. I like good preaching. If the only time you can get happy in preaching is when you preach and you got the wrong spirit. Amen. I've enjoyed all of these. But I, that's not what I rose to talk about. Um, these presidents have worked so hard. I, uh, we had an emergency call with the chairman. And, and then on the... Uh, 16th of June, we had to try to turn some things around to try to uh, make ends meet for uh, this convention and try to get ourselves in a better condition. This chairman, with his uh, innovation, um, we had to cut some costs and um, we had to come together in the daytime for this year. But my God, that God set his approval on that. Amen. And we had to cut some other corners. You don't see them gray big screen. Oh, yeah, they do. They got the screen. Somebody said they didn't have the screen. They do got the screen. But we had to cut some other costs. We had to cut a whole lot of things. And I want to thank these presidents. Come here, Superintendent.